Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. This is a Fireside Frights episode. In fact, Fireside Frights number 26, where once a month I strip away all of the music, sound effects, and fancy audio production. It's just you, me, this campfire, and stories sent in to me by you, members of our weirdo family. And if you have a true story of something paranormal that's happened to you or someone you know, you can email your story. Just go to WeirdDarkness.com and click on Tell Your Story. That's WeirdDarkness.com and then click on Tell Your Story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Our first letter comes from Rashawn saying, Hey Darren, I binge listen to your podcast daily while at work or around the house and love the format and production quality. I have more than a few different true strange stories that have happened in my life, but the other day, while listening, I was reminded of one I thought I'd share. My family were in ministry and adopted me whilst living in a parsonage next to the church my dad preached at. We lived there for the first two years of my life, and I clearly have memories from that home. Once my siblings convinced me our cat was in the closet under the stairs, and after crawling inside, as a joke, they shut the door behind me. In the darkness, I remember thinking I saw him, the cat, but the eyes were glowing yellow, and I remember screaming in terror. My mom came and got me, and I just remember being inconsolable. I was maybe one and a half at the time. Some context. This house was built maybe in the 50s, out in the middle of the country on a rock foundation. It sits next to an old country church that serves the local farming community. The minister's families move in and out as they come and go. Nothing nefarious that I'm aware of has ever happened inside the house. It's just old and a bit remote. It has three bedrooms on the first floor and two on the second, with a few attic storage closets off each room and the upstairs hall. Fast forward five years, and the new family living in the parsonage were friends of ours. Their kids were the same ages as my siblings and I. Our brothers would dare my friend and I to sit in the attic storage space as long as we could because something was in there, and they would say how the doors would open at night and things would be moved. It always creeped us all out, but I chalked it up to my brothers being jerks, <laughs> as the memories from being a toddler hadn't resurfaced just yet. Fast forward four years, and my dad gets rehired to preach at the church, so we move back into that same house. I turn 11 in that house, and my brother and I have the two rooms upstairs. The attic storage door in my bedroom would randomly open in the night, even with the latch slid shut. The floors would creak, and my brother and I hated walking past the attic storage in the upstairs hall as we always felt like something was going to reach out and grab you. I asked my dad about it, and he gave all the usual drafty old house or settling floors answers and shoo-shooed me away. Around 12, I started having intense, hyper-realistic dreams about events or people. I would tell my dad about them, and weeks or months later, those things would happen. After we both realized the correlation, he encouraged me to start writing them down. Around 13, my brother left home for college, and I was upstairs alone as the only child and the dreams and feelings of fear intensified. The relationship with my mom was not good at this time, as she had some mental health issues, so I kept most of the events to myself, save for the biggest ones that I told my dad about. Until one night, I had a hyper-realistic dream that led to me not sleeping at night for two weeks straight. 
In the dream, I was staying the night at my friend's house when I woke up to see a creature sitting on her floor watching me. Its skin was gaunt and stone gray, stretched over its bones like it was emaciated. It turned its head from side to side like a dog would, but skin was stretched over its eye sockets and its mouth was just a slit. It sat on the ground with its spindly knees pulled up and its hands resting on the knees like a gargoyle. When it saw me wake up, it fluttered its tattered bony wings and hopped, kind of like the flying monkeys on the Wizard of Oz, out of the room. I woke up in terror and, as I said, didn't sleep at night for two weeks. My dad suggested I pray for protection every night before bed, and being a devout baptized believer in Jesus, I did. But the upstairs felt even more foreboding than before, like I was always being watched. A month later, I woke up inside the same dream. Same friend's room, same creature, same hyper-realistic feeling, except this time I calmly got out of my friend's bed in the dream and followed the creature out the door. I remember everything was a dull gray color and nothing in the house had color to it, just dark contrast. I followed this hopping creature down the hall to my friend's brother's room where he lies sleeping. When I turned into the doorway, I saw a dozen of them all over his room, sitting on his chest, on his bed, around the floor. I tried to enter the room, but I couldn't. I was stuck in the doorway. When they noticed me, they fluttered their tattered wings and flinched. I yelled for them to leave him alone and get out in the name of Jesus Christ! Leave this house! They all fluttered and stretched to their wings like I had thrown a rock into a flock of buzzards. With one raspy chorus of voices in unison, they said, You may have the blood, but he doesn't. And as I looked down at my night shirt, it was covered in the brightest crimson blood I have ever seen. It was the only thing with color in the whole dream, and it almost glowed against all the gray. As I looked up, I saw them grab him under his arms and flew up through the corner of his room. With that, I woke up. When I told my dad about it after the shock wore off a bit, he sat eyes wide and silent. He suggested I tell the boy about my dream, even though he couldn't explain why I kept having them. He still believes to this day that I witnessed and was protected from real demons. The dream in itself is its own story, but I really believe it's connected to whatever was in that house. We finally moved when I was 14 and I never had a dream of that nature, but still have plenty of odd prophetic ones to this day. Fast forward to a couple years ago when I was 32, and my mom and I had repaired our relationship. We were talking about my strange premonitions as a kid, and I brought up the attic doors in that house. She legit went white and asked me what I meant. I explained I had to keep furniture in front of all the doors because they would come open even when latched. She told me that when they first moved into that house before they adopted me, the doors upstairs did the same thing and it scared her so bad she made my dad nail them all closed. But when the next family moved in, they pulled all the nails out. Apparently my dad never told her I was having the same issues while we lived there because he didn't want to scare her. This all may seem crazy, but it's just what happened and honestly, I wouldn't wish those dreams on my worst enemy. Anyway, thanks for taking the time to read one of my weird encounters. I have plenty more stories from the haunted house I grew up in, to dreams that have been journaled only to come true years later, to me seeing the spirit of my past cousin dancing at her own wake and nephew-in-law coming to meet my daughter a year after his death. Keep being awesome. Signed, Rashawn. What a way to start a fireside frights! Rashawn, oh my gosh, that is such an amazing, well, I'm going to say testimony. I, mean, I, I know it's a story and I know it's, it's true, but man, I mean, that's a, from, a, from one Christian to another, that sounds like a testimony, dude. That is amazing. Uh, I think you, you may have been, you, well, you say, you, from the beginning here, you say that, you're a, that you were a, a believer in Jesus. Uh, it would not surprise me at all if he gave you the spirit of prophecy. The, uh, the the spiritual gift uh, of prophecy. Uh, and not necessarily to tell the future, although it sounds like maybe it actually is kind of giving you that. And 
which which makes me wonder about your friend. You, uh, your dad told you that you ought to tell your friend what it was that you dreamed about. I would love to know what his response was, because when that when those we're gonna call, I'm gonna call them demons, but those those dog creatures with the with the wings and everything else. I'm just gonna say those are demons, just just to make things simple. When those demons in the dream saw you walking into your friend's room and and you told them to get out in Jesus' name, but they said that you have the blood, he doesn't, that immediately struck me as you have the blood of Jesus on you. You accepted Christ. You accepted what he did for you on the cross, so you are protected by his blood. Was your friend not a Jesus believer? Had he not given his life to Christ? If so, he wasn't to paraphrase, bathed in the blood of Jesus at that time. So you had the blood. You, if they were attacking you, you would have been able to to be protected, and you were protected from them because they didn't harm you. But they they were they were at his house and him, and I don't know. That that is that is really, really strange. I don't know if that actually happened in real life or if it was just in your dream because it very well could have been like a spiritual dimension type of thing i'm i'm going off the cuff here i have no biblical precedent for this at all i'm just thinking off the top of my head but it almost sounds like oh it, it almost sounds like you were spirit walking you know um astral projection type of thing you're stepping into it which i i don't know the spiritual aspect of that i used to think uh, astral projection was was very much anti-Christ, very much you know devilish. But I'm I'm beginning to wonder if maybe I was wrong on that, and um, maybe God gives us certain gifts to use for certain moments. And you you have this moment right here, which would be a prime example of it. Being able to astral project, even though you did not intend to, it's just ha something that that happened. You were taken into his dream, maybe, and in a way, you kind of you kind of witnessed. Uh, to him. I don't know. I don't know. I'm rambling. What, what, a cool, what a great way to start, though. But I would love to hear what your friend said uh, about the dream once you went to go tell him. So Because you, you, you could have been trying to do spiritual battle right there, and he never would have known it. Um, now, it would have been real cool if when you went to tell your friend, he actually had the same dream, and that you came into his room, and and they said that you had the blood and he didn't. And Now that would just be freaky. So anyway, uh, I would love to get a, an update on that, Rashawn. If you want to drop me an email, I'd appreciate it. This next one comes from Re. She says, hello, Darren. Just call me Re. It's pronounced how it looks. I want to share this creepy yet funny story from my past. This may be a long one, so I apologize in advance. OK, well, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you right here, Re. This is not a long paragraph. This is not a long story at all. Um, and continuing on. So my dad passed away in April 2013, and a week after he passed, I met my amazing now husband and soulmate. My now husband and I met online and quickly became best friends. We had decided to finally meet up exactly two months and two days after my dad's passing. We meet up and quickly realize we had a spark, so we decided to date. During our time together, he'd come down and stay, and I'd tell him the creepy things that started happening after my dad's passing. You'd hear glass break. Nothing would be there. Phones would act up. Facebook posts would be brought up, but only ones about him. Just weird stuff. So with him knowing that, he would still come and stay with me at my house, and one night while we were sleeping, I was facing away from him and he was facing my back. He asked if I had touched his back. I said, no, there was no possible way I could have done it with, uh, uh, without touching his side, and it was probably just my dad letting him know that he was still around and to not let it bother him. Even after all of that, he still stayed with me at my house, and now we've been together for 10 years. Thanks so much for all that you do. You're truly appreciated. Best wishes, Re. Well, thank you, Re. I appreciate the email. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe your dad was kind of... If, if I was your dad... And and yeah, you had a guy there that you weren't married to yet, because you know, being you know, being the old fuddy duddy that I am, <laughs> I would probably be the ghost of your dad going up there and say, Hey, 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 mister, hey, hey, I'm watching you. All right, I'm watching you, but you better not you better not hurt my little girl. That's all I'm saying. Okay. 
Uh, let's see, moving on here, we've got uh, Kenzie. She says, hey, Darren, I would like to tell you about a few of my experiences with the supernatural. I always knew I could see things, but I wasn't quite sure what they were until now. When I was little, I went to an elementary school in the middle of Virginia. During recess, I'd always see teenagers from the local high school ditching and walking behind my school, but this particular afternoon, I looked into the woods to see a short, old woman with a black cloak on. I see her every day in the same spot looking at me. The only part of her that was not covered by the cloak was her face, which was pale and wrinkly. Her eyes were black, but for some reason I knew she was looking at me. A few years went by, and I decided to research my story to see if anybody else had experienced it. Nobody did, but I did find out that the school was built on an Indian burial ground, and they did not remove all the bodies. I felt as if the woman I saw was asking me for help in the only way she knew. All right, well, before we go on to your next story, seriously, yet another story about Indian burial grounds. Will people never, ever learn that's not a, not a place to build? Serious, especially if you're not going to move all the bodies. Have you people not seen Poltergeist the movie? Seriously. All right, moving on. Your other story says, when I was 10 to 14, I lived in an apartment in Virginia. For the first few months, it was all right, just your typical apartment. My grandma had come out to visit us, and her and, her, and uh, my mom were sleeping on the couches. My grandma had woken up to see a little boy in blue pajamas reaching out to my mom trying to touch her. Here's something to note. Almost every woman in my family can see or talk to spirits. My grandma yelled out, Athena, wake up and go to bed. My mother didn't know why until the next morning when my grandma told her. We continued to see little kids run through the apartment every once in a while. In the same apartment, I had a friend stay the night. She was sleeping on the top bed of my trundle, and I was on the bottom. She wakes up and crawls down to me and holds me out of fear because, in her words, she saw a tall, black figure in my closet staring at me. She felt so sick to her stomach and uh, as if something was going to happen to me. Her crawling down was to try and protect me from what she saw. I wasn't surprised when she told me as I had experiences with someone crawling on my bed and sitting on my chest almost every night. I had some more experiences in that apartment, but now I live in California with my family in a beautiful house. No experiences yet, and hopefully not soon. Just wanted to share my story and hope someone will listen. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kenzie. I, I appreciate that. You know, that second story, you said you almost, almost every night had something crawling on your chest in the middle of the night. That sounds very much like the like the old hag syndrome with sleep paralysis. I, you don't mention whether or not you were paralyzed or not uh, when it happened, but that sounds very, very similar. And for it to go away after you leave that location just lends that much more credibility to my theory that there is a demonic influence when it comes to sleep paralysis. Not in all cases, but in many. And right there because if it was just a psychological thing if it was it was if it was something chemical in your body or whatever it probably wouldn't go away just because you changed locations but as soon as you moved suddenly it stopped that makes me think that there was something in that house that was tormenting you causing that to happen so thank you very much kenzie i appreciate it let's see this next one comes from diane she says hi darren this is a story told to me by my mom, who was born and raised in Vietnam. Oh, this ought to be an interesting one. Um, when she was around 11 years old, she knew of an older girl who attended her school that had recently committed suicide. Some of her friends thought it'd be a good idea to go to the cemetery where she was buried and use some sort of spirit board to try and communicate with the girl's spirit. My mom, dumb and naive as she described, agreed to go with them. At first, she only watched and did not participate as the other three girls asked questions while placing their fingers on the planchette. She saw the planchette move in response to their questions such as, will I be rich or will I win a beauty pageant? After a while, my mom became skeptical and accused the three girls of moving it. They all denied it and told her to try and see for herself. My mom agreed, and with her finger placed alongside theirs, they proceeded to ask more questions. The planchette did not budge. After several non-responses, 
One of the girls said it was not working anymore because my mom was the only Catholic person in the group. The other three girls were Buddhist. They told my mom to take her finger off, and sure enough, it proceeded to move again. It was then that my mom realized that the other girls' fingers were barely touching the planchette, so it was not likely that they were the ones moving it either. That evening, my mom told her mother what happened at the cemetery, and she received the tongue lashing of her life. She never got involved with anything like that again, and she told us this story to remind us to never, ever mess with such things. She also believes the experience reaffirmed her faith in the Lord and is a testament uh, testament to God's power over all things. Thank you for all you do. Signed, Diane. Well, I'm really glad that your mom is okay in that. You know, that is the first time I think I've heard of of a spirit board not working because some. Well, it doesn't surprise me if that somebody might be religious of the of the Christian faith and a spirit board wouldn't work. But this is the first time I've heard that it wouldn't work because one person happened to be a follower of Jesus, and as soon as they walked walked away, then suddenly it would work. Especially with three Buddhists, that, that was, that's that's very unique. I don't think I've ever heard that particular scenario in the past. And I'm not saying, by the way, that Catholicism is the quote unquote correct way to worship. I think there are there are several different denominations. You go with the one that makes the most sense to you, so long as you get the basics right when it comes to Christianity. You know. Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose from the dead, conquering death so you can have eternal life. Uh, that I mean, that's that's pretty much it. Every, anything else after that is like a secondary issue, and you can all battle over that as, as much as you want. Um, and the Catholics do believe that, so that that will make that's what makes me uh, think there could have been some power there. But I'm glad that it did, uh, as you say, reaffirm her faith in the Lord. Yeah, something like that. If if it really it. <laughs> <laughs> it would literally scare the hell out of you, and uh, sometimes that's a good thing. Okay, this next one comes from. Let's see. They don't sign it, so uh, I'll just I'll just say anonymous just to be safe. This is a very short story that has always creeped me out. One night, as the family was getting ready for bed, I sat in the living room and was watching my normal shows when I hear my six-year-old son yell for me from his upstairs bedroom. Knowing he's afraid of the dark and he's just starting to sleep in a room on his own, my thoughts are he's just being dramatic about the ordeal. So I go upstairs and see my son sitting straight up in bed. He is oddly calm for just having screamed for me, but I go to him and kneel beside him and ask, what's the matter? He turns and says, there's something under the bed, can you check for me? I sigh and oblige his request. I look under the bed and there's my son hugging his stuffed animal, his eyes wide and clearly scared out of his mind. He puts his finger to his lips for me to be quiet and whispers to me, Dad, there's a monster on my bed. Alright, is that a real story? I'm wondering if you didn't sign that because that's not because that's not actually a real story, because that definitely sounds like something that that sounds like a story we would use in Micro Terror's scary stories for kids. <laughs> If it is a real story, it's very, very creepy. It's it's a little too perfect. I'm I'm thinking maybe someone's trying to pull a pull a fast one on me on that one. But still, it was a fun story. So, uh, for for you who shared that, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, looks like this next one wasn't signed either, so we'll keep this one anonymous. In early 2016, I got pregnant with my son. I worked the overnight shift at a hospital in Maryland when I was active duty in the Navy. Oh well. Um, thank you very much for your service. I appreciate that. I'd, uh, I wished my mom was still alive my entire pregnancy because she would have loved to be a part of everything because she had died in March of 2012. When I'd be up during the time, when I would be up during the days, I would constantly see butterflies, even in the winter, epically towards the middle and end of my third trimester, uh, when there was snow all around. When I had finally went into labor on December 31st, I had seen so many butterflies I couldn't believe it. At 12 a.m. on January 1st, the doctors decided to do a C-section due to the underlying complications with the contractions. They finally got me into the surgery room and successfully was able to birth my son while waiting in the post-op temporary holding room. My mom had come up to me and said that my son was so handsome and that she will always be there for him. 
Oh, how sweet. So, the ghost of your mother... Well, let me let me reread re that. I want to see if I uh, successfully you you gave birth to your son, and while waiting in the post-op temporary holding room, my mom had come to me and said that my son was so handsome, and that she will always be there for him. And you mentioned earlier that your mom had passed away in 2012. So you're saying that the ghost of your mother was there for your pregnancy, well, for your birth, at least, the birth of your son. That that is amazing. Well, th thank you very much for sharing that. I appreciate it. The butterflies is really, really beautiful. It makes, you, it makes me wonder if that was your mom, if that was just kind of her way of saying, hey, I'm with you. I'm, I'm here with you. It's just helping you to see beauty all around you, even in the winter months. Okay, let's see. This next one comes from Lori. She says, hi, uh, stumbled onto your podcast. When I was 10 years old, we were on our way to North Carolina to see a sister. On my way, my parents decided to detour and drive through the Gettysburg battlefield, and my mom and I saw a group of men in Civil War gear. I was watching as they disappeared. Mom said they went into the woods. When we got to the souvenir store, mom told the sales clerk that it was nice that the park had men dressed out there. She was told there was no reenactment that day. Being 10 years, my mother was going to argue in front of the clerk. The clerk later found me and said that I was right. They get a lot of reports like the one my mom was talking about. And I'd been right all along, but not to aggravate my mom. Lori, thank you very much. I have heard this story before. I'm not, I'm not telling you that it didn't happen to you, because I would never call somebody a liar, but I have heard this exact same story. So either you sent it in before, and I've, I've read it, or I've read it, or if somebody else had the same encounter. People going to a Civil War battlefield, in fact, I do believe it was Gettysburg, seeing men dressed in Civil War uniforms, and the family or whoever it was thought that there was a reenactment taking place, and that's why they had people there. And then they went to a store or to a hotel or, or wherever and said, it's really neat that you guys, uh, guys have people in uniform reenacting the, the, the war, and then are told that there is no reenactment and that there are no actors. I've heard that before. So, again, not calling you a liar. I just, it's interesting that, uh, but, uh, but I, I remember reading that. I remember. Um, okay, let, let's just move on then. Let's see. This one comes from Bill. He says, Hi, Darren. Firstly, I'll apologize for my poor grammar and spelling. I'm one of those 80s kids who was let down by the education system. Here's one you may like, as it's much different from anything else I've heard on your podcasts, which I really enjoy, by the way. Anyway, that out of the way. I, uh, any, oh, anyway, that out of the way. I'd like to start by saying I have difficulties believing in devils, demons, angels, etc. I believe evil uh, demons. Evil. Let's go. I believe evil demands good, and angels are a creation of the dark depths of the human psyche, and in turn, good is its balance. Not exactly sure what you mean by that, Bill, but okay. Uh, anyway, if you hold that thought, I'll put something to you, and it's easier if I can, if I can take you back. You've heard of Groundhog, of Groundhog Day. My Groundhog Day goes like this. It's a beautiful, hot, and sunny day in the wake of some war, first or second, it doesn't matter. The one thing certain is I'm standing by a small metal fence looking down into what would have been a deep basement of a bombed-out building. I look down approximately 20 feet to the rubble and the standard discarded items. One item catches my gaze. I cannot take my eyes off it. The item in question is a rolled-up carpet, and there's nothing too interesting about this carpet except I know what's inside it. You see, the carpet held a secret, the secret of a body, a body an I and a friend had dumped there. Yes, you read this right. Me and my friend savagely killed another person and dumped the body in plain sight. This wasn't the only person I had murdered. I had also killed another man. Now, before you call the police, hold your dialing finger. Waiting to dispose of the body, I clearly remember the putrid smell of rotten flesh. You smell death once you never forget it. Oh, you smell death once you never forget it. I had to get rid of quickly or be discovered, so I disposed of the body by putting it in black bin bags and burying it in a raised flower bed at the end of my garden. Going through the memories of these murders continued for a long time. It was a Groundhog Day that I can never forget. Now, am I a bad person? Am I evil? 
I don't know, but what I can tell you is these were recurring dreams I had for many years from the moment I can remember ever being able to recall dreams. The thing is, I recounted the experiences whilst I was a very young child, probably starting at around, around the age 4 or 5. I remember the smells, and I remember a rope around my neck before everything went black. Did I really murder two men? I must have. Did I relive a previous life experience? I don't believe in reincarnation, but I can't explain it. One thing I am sure of is I've always had acceptance of death, even as a child. And the first time in this life I smelt death, I knew that smell. So if there is such a thing as reincarnation, do we get one chance to rectify our previous mistakes? If so, I'm screwed, as I can't say I've been a saint in this life. Many things I've done I'm not proud of. However, in this life I've never killed someone. Well, I don't think I have. If we get more chances and good prevails, then I hope then I hope I should return as a human and I can be the best person I can be. You see, as the title suggests, a child should never know. Cheers, signed Bill. Well, that's right, I guess you did put that as the subject line. A child should never know. <sighs> All right, Bill. Um, I don't know if you're literally asking me these questions or not. Uh, uh, first, no, I don't believe in reincarnation. Um, so I, I believe you get one shot, and that's and that's it. And you either give your life to Christ or you don't, and that's your decision. Uh, it, I mean, God's not going to force you to to accept His Son. Uh, he's not going to try to scare you into it. It's just it's it's up to you whether or not you want to accept that gift. Uh, that being said, you. You say, however, in this life, I've never killed someone. However, in this life, I've never killed someone. As if, okay, well, maybe I'm going to go to heaven because I've never killed anybody. It doesn't work that way. Um, if that's, that's comparing yourself to others. Who are you comparing yourself to? You, you can't get to heaven on a curve. Um... This is difficult to do right off the cuff. I'm, I'm trying to put into words what I what I want to say here, but it's not a it's not a scale where if you do more good things than bad, then you're going to make it to heaven. That it doesn't work that way. You have to be absolutely perfect in order to get into heaven. You cannot have lied even once. You cannot have stolen a piece of candy as a kid knowing that it was wrong. Well, not even once. Uh, no, no committing adultery, no killing, obviously. But the, the, problem, the thing is, none of us can live that life. None of us can be perfect. And that's the whole point. That's why Jesus came, because he lived the perfect life. So he stepped in our place. Because the, the wages of sin is death, meaning... If you commit just one single sin, you deserve death. And not just death in the physical life, but death in the spiritual life as well. Hell, essentially. But God loves us so much, he doesn't want to see that happen to us, so he sent his son to be sort of our our pinch hitter, I guess, for, for lack of better words. Instead of us being punished for the sins that we've committed, Jesus got punished for us. Because he was the perfect sacrifice, he was able to give that perfection to us through his, that his righteousness is what it's called. He was able to give that to us if we just accept the gift that he actually gave his life for us, took on our sins, and died in our place. That's where it works. So the idea, however, in this life I've never killed someone, that that's not going to fly. Um, and I, I hope you think about it. I know you said you don't believe in angels, you don't believe in demons, and that's another topic for another day. You might want to just check out my Church of the Undead podcast, because I do cover that once in a while. Maybe that'll answer a couple of questions for you. Um, and if you want me to in the future for a Fireside Frights or a Chamber of Comments, if you want me to get involved in that a little bit more, I can. But uh, it, I, I, hopefully I've at least given you something to, to think about tonight. So thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate the story. All right, our next story comes from uh, Irinan. Irinan? 
She says, it's not my real name. Would you like for me to, um, would like to use this for my pen name? Ir, Iron, Irinen, Ironen. Iron, Iron. I'm, I'm very sorry. <laughs> However you want to pronounce that, I'm, I, I apologize. Um, but Lady Ironen. Uh, that's the way I'm going to call you. Anyway, she says, I have a Shadow Man story for you. I am from England, UK. I originally lived in Somerset in the West County of England, or excuse me, West Country of England, and moved to London at 18 years old. I first lived in Hearn Hill in South London and moved shortly after to a place called Plumstead in Southeast London to live with my best friend at her granddad's three-story Victorian house. As soon as I set foot in the house, I knew it was haunted. I'm clairsentient with extremely high intuition bordering on partial psychic abilities. Believe it or not, at the time, I ignored this as part of me was agnostic about ghosts and didn't really believe in them. I had cognitive dissonance about them. Weird, I know. I fully expect and embrace my beliefs in ghosts and the spirit world now. After about six to eight months of living there, I had a premonition that if I were to sleep on my back, I would see something. It started first with something shaking my bed. Lo and behold, one night I was sleeping on my back, I woke up to extreme paralysis. All I could move was my eyes. I noticed a six-foot black shadow man standing at the side of my bed, staring down at me in a stern, disapproving manner. He had white, horizontal, almost uh, almond-shaped eyes, and he was darker than the dark of the room. There was a static in the room. I was in a trance that I felt that this spirit prepared me for. It was extremely eerie, but I was not petrified. He said to me telepathically, what are you doing here? I replied back telepathically, I live here. He let me go and I fell back to sleep. In the morning, he was gone. Three days later, I heard a male, bre uh, sorry, excuse me. Three days later, I heard male breathing coming from the couch in my room, which coincidentally used to be my best friend's granddad's father's living room when he lived there decades ago. It was the first room on the bottom floor. As soon as you entered the front door, it was the first room on the right. This male breathing actually scared me more than the sighting as it confirmed that what I saw was real and not a hypnopompic... Hypno, hypnopompic? That, there's a big word for you. Hypnopompic hallucination, like science wants us to believe. This shadow man did not hurt me and I'm lucky and privileged to have met him. He was actually okay. Sometimes I think back and feel happy about meeting him, and sometimes I'll remember the way he was staring at me, and I get a bit freaked out. It also looked like he was hooded. His eyes are something I'll never forget. After me and my friend stopped being friends and I moved out, the grandfather died of diabetic complications, and his son sold the house to a company that refurbished it for an assisted living house for people with mental health issues. Years later, I went back to talk to the woman who ran it. I told her that I used to live there. She showed me around, and I saw how beautiful the refurbishments looked. I asked her if she saw or felt anything there. She said that her husband could feel the bed being shaken, and she also said that something was picked up on the outside camera. I was talking with her in what used to be the woodwork room on the second floor, which was now a leisure room. I could sense my ex-best friend's grandfather, Tony, who died of the diabetes complications, sitting on one of the chairs in the room. He's there too now. I haven't been back. I still live in London. Thank you, Darren, for your channel and podcast. I really enjoy it. Best regards, Lady Erdenen, subscriber to your channel. Thank you very much, uh, Lady E. I uh, really appreciate that. So you threw a couple of uh, new new words at me. I got to look up a little bit later on. <laughs> uh, hypno, what was that again? Hypnopompic. Hypnopompic. I'm going to have to look up that to see what that means. Um, I've heard of hypnog hypnagogic jerks. Hypnopompic hallucinations. That's a new one on me. And then you threw me another one, clairsentient. I've heard of clairvoyant. I've heard of sentient. Clairsentient is, uh, is a new combo. So thank you for the homework that you've given me, lady. I really appreciate it. Uh, okay, this next one comes from Mary. She says, about six years ago, I experienced the darkest times of my life. At first, I didn't know why everything around me, from personal relationships to my relationships with my two daughters, seemed to be falling apart. 
It was like my children had become total strangers and I was just no fun to be around for family and friends. I lived in constant fear and major confusion. Out of concern for my daughters, 15 and 10, I reached out to a neuro, uh, neuropsychologist, I think is what you're trying to say there, a neuropsychologist that had been recommended to me. She had a great reputation for helping patients with some of the same symptoms my daughters were experiencing – cutting, lying, detachment, anger, etc. After a few months and several diagnoses from depression, PTSD to ADHD to severe anxiety disorder, a dark truth was revealed. My daughter's father had been molesting them in the most violent way imaginable. During this time, my daughters and I all saw dark shadows lurking in our home, mainly between our bedrooms in the back of the house. We turned to law enforcement and received nothing but accusations of making everything up. We were in fear constantly. I, f I feared, since they had come forward with the terrible truth, that they may be at risk for their lives, especially since their father knew he had been reported. Months went by and we knew we were being watched. His business was in surveillance. Dark shadows continued to move around in our house. With no help from the people we sought protection from, I only had God to turn to. I prayed for God to heal and protect all of us, especially my two precious daughters. I felt like I was going crazy and often hoped I was. Madness would have been better than the painful truth. I had murder in my mind and heart. It seemed justifiable, but I knew it may do more damage than good if I wasn't around to help them heal. After several months of therapy and fear, not to mention all the other emotions that circulated around us, my ex-husband shot and killed his beautiful young girlfriend in front of their six-month-old son. Then he shot and killed himself. The dark shadows disappeared. After such a long time of fear and darkness, I could finally see the light and, fortunately for me, uh, he had the murder-suicide recorded, so I wasn't a suspect. At this time, I'd been accused of being everything from a lying drug addict to a crazy, vindictive ex-wife. I wholeheartedly know that my prayers and my family's prayers kept us alive. We're continuing to heal, and I'm so thankful God protected us. Man, I am so sorry you had to go through all of that, Mary. That is just horrible. Even, even the death of the demon ex-husband, still, even, even that, I mean, he is still as horrible as he was, as, as evil of a person as he was, he was still the father of your daughters, and I know that had to have been tough to live through. Makes me really, and, and I'm not using demon and evil lightly here, it really does, especially with the dark shadows and everything, it really sounds like your husband may very well have been possessed. Um, I, I have a hard time seeing how anybody could do what your husband did to your daughters without some sort of demonic influence. I just can't, I have a hard time seeing that kind of evil coming without some sort of supernatural paranormal aspect to it. It's just so, so dark. Um, but that combined with the dark shadows that you kept seeing and uh, and everything else that you went through, and then suddenly all of that disappearing when he committed suicide, makes me think he actually was possessed. Uh, I, I hope and pray that God that uh, God continues to heal your family, you and your daughters, and I'm sure you know about it, but if you need help when it comes to depression or or anything else, I do have a lot of resources there on my Hope in the Darkness page. If you just go to WeirdDarkness.com slash hope, um, there's a lot of stuff there that might be able to to help you. Okay, this next uh, next one comes from Chris, saying, Hi, Darren. I've been a listener for about six months now. Been catching up on all your podcasts. I've had many experiences in my life, beginning at a very young age, and I've been contemplating writing a book compiling every experience that I can recall. For now, I'll share my stories with you, and I'd appreciate it if you just use the name Chris. This first story is very short, and it's my very first experience that I can remember as a child. When I was four years old, my mom had begun renting a cute little house in the country somewhere in Oregon State. I remember the property surrounded by fields of tall cheatgrass and various wildflowers. We didn't stay there long, 
Later, I found out that my mom was only caring for the house temporarily while the family figured out the estate. This house once belonged to an elderly woman that recently passed due to natural causes, I believe. I only remember sleeping in a bedroom with floral wallpaper and a floral quilt on a bed with a classic brass bed frame. I was awoken in the middle of the night. I don't know what time it was, but I do remember it was still very dark outside and yet there seemed to be just enough light coming in through the single bedroom window that allowed me to make out the shapes and silhouettes of the furniture in the room. I'd woken up because I thought I heard a cat meowing. As I laid there awake for a moment to see if I could hear the meowing again, I felt something jump on the bed at my feet and lay down. I wasn't scared, but curious. What just sat on my bed? When I sat up and looked at the spot where I felt the presence, I saw a beautiful, white, long-haired cat. I remember saying, hi, kitty, and I pet its soft, warm fur. The cat never moved, but I do remember it had purred as if it was enjoying the attention. I then told the cat that it was time to go back to sleep, and I laid back down and fell asleep. When I woke the next morning, I looked all over my room for that beautiful white cat. When I couldn't find it in my room, I began looking throughout the house, calling, here, kitty, kitty. My mom was in the kitchen cooking breakfast, and when she heard me calling for the cat, she asked, what are you doing? To which I responded, I'm looking for the pretty white kitty. My mom, confused, said, but honey, we don't have any pets. I then told my mom about the experience in my room the night before. My mom insisted that it must have been a dream. I must have been upset at this because I implored with her that it was real, that I had touched it and it was real. At the time, I didn't know what the look of my mom's face meant, but she agreed to help me look for the cat, and once we gave up the search, we never spoke of the cat again. Thinking back on it now, I think my mom didn't want to frighten me with details of the old lady who died and had a pet cat. So that's my first story of unexplained experiences. I'll share more of my stories in the future. Thanks for creating a safe space to share the unexplained. Your fellow weirdo, Chris. Thank you, Chris. That's a really great st for your first story too. For that for that first paranormal thing to happen to you. That is that's kind of it's it's tame. It's almost it's kind of sweet too. Almost like well, I don't I don't know what happened to the cat from from the old lady if the cat died too. Maybe the cat uh, maybe the lady died and so she wasn't able to take care of the cat and the cat died before anybody found the old lady or whatever. I don't know, but it's almost like the ghost of the cat saying, hey, I need somebody to love me. Chris, will you love me, please? <laughs> uh, pet ghosts, they they, they exist. Uh, this next one comes from, let's see here, from Jane. Okay. Hi again, it's, it's Jane from Erie, Pennsylvania. I thought I'd sit down and send you another true paranormal experience I had when I was a teenager. But before I do that, I thought you might get a kick out of something that just happened to me the other night. As you know, I'm a fairly new fan, but loving every episode. I've been trying to listen to as many as I can. I happen to listen to your episode that you did back on March 31st, your Friday Night Frights Live about the black-eyed kids. Gotta tell you, I usually don't get scared or creeped out by much, but that particular episode got to me, lol. Right after I got done listening to it, my husband was sitting in his recliner with a really funny look on his face. He didn't hear the podcast because I was listening with my earbuds but he was looking at me with this weird look. He had the volume of the TV on mute and kept looking around, trying to hear something. I asked him what was going on. He said he kept hearing this really weird light tapping and couldn't figure out where it was coming from. My daughter and I didn't hear a thing, but he said he kept hearing it. Then it suddenly stopped. Then our ring cameras all of a sudden stopped working. At this point, I was waiting for someone to show up asking to come into our house, but thankfully that didn't happen. But I did make my daughters stand by the door while I took our dog out for the final time that night. LOL. You have to love the timing of all that happened. <laughs> oh. I, I was wondering where you were going with that. I, I was thinking, oh my gosh, they're going to knock on the door. She's actually going to open it up. There's going to be there's going to be a black-eyed kid there, isn't there? There's going to be one. There's going to be one. Nope. <laughs> That's what they say, though. They say um, once you know about black-eyed kids, once you hear about them, you're you are that much more apt to have an experience. So, not that I told the story purposefully so people would have the experience. 
uh, it's because I don't necessarily believe that particular aspect of the legend. Uh, but it's interesting that that would happen to you that night, too. That's that's funny. Uh, okay, on to the experience that happened to me when I was a teenager. So I'm continuing on with Jane's email. I was a teenager back in the 80s, you know, back when us girls used to curl our hair and use a lot of hairspray. Yes, Jane, I do remember those days. I miss those days. I really loved 80s hair. I did. For the guys and the girls. I had, I had really long hair as well um, on the front, combed back, almost like not quite a pompadour, but, you know, it was feathered back and lots of hairspray for that, too. So you know, it wasn't just the girls. Uh, OK, she anyway, she says, I bring that up because the hairspray is a big part of the story. My mother and I live in a house in downtown Erie, Pennsylvania. This house was converted into four big apartments. My mother and I lived in, in one on the first floor, one of the first floor apartments. These apartments always had a creepy feel to them. I mean, you'd always feel like someone was walking behind you when you were home alone. I was always hearing someone or something walking in our hallways of the apartment. I had a black cat back then. Her name was Midnight. She'd even act like there was something there. She would walk around and literally turn around and bat at midair like she was going after something. Anyway, I digress. I was getting ready to go to a Halloween party with a group of my friends. I was dressed in my French maid costume and still had to do my hair. So I was sitting at the end of the hallway that leads into my bedroom. The way the apartment was laid out was my mother's bedroom was off the living room. Then off the living room was a long hallway that led to the back of the apartment and my bedroom was on the right and the kitchen was in the back. I was sitting on the floor with my curling iron and mirror on a chair. I had my hairspray on the floor behind me. My mother and her boyfriend at the time were sitting on the couch watching TV while I was getting ready. My cat was sitting beside me watching. I just curled my hair, put down the curling iron, and reached behind me to get the hairspray can that was just behind me, but it wasn't there. I got up thinking I'd kicked it under something, but it wasn't anywhere to be found. I asked my mother if she saw it or moved it, but she said no. In fact, she and her boyfriend hadn't even moved from the couch, so there was no way either of them could have done anything with the can. Midnight, the cat hadn't even moved either, so I got up looking around for that hairspray. I walked down the hallway, then turned right and went into my bedroom. There, under my bed, was my can of hairspray that was just minutes before behind me in the living room. I come out with it in my hand, and both my mother and boyfriend said they saw me put it behind me on the floor. There was no way it could have gotten into my bedroom without any one of us seeing the other one placing it there. It was really weird. Weird things like that would happen all the time in that apartment. I always felt creeped out there. I have had other creepy experiences that happened there, but I'll save that for another email. Thanks for letting me share, and I'm a big fan and absolutely love your podcast. Hugs, Jane. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate it. And I also appreciate the visual that you gave me about an 80s girl working on her hair wearing a maid outfit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, suddenly not to be 18 again. Oh, those were the days. Okay, I've got one final story uh, tonight. Uh, this one, let's see, I want to make sure that they don't want to remain anonymous. Uh, well, they don't sign it, so I'll just, I'll, I'll go with anonymous anyway, just to be safe. I have a story for you, though formerly published. Unlike most stories you'll hear around the internet, this one is true because it happened to me on a windswept summer's night. I call it the girl under the blood moon. We used to have a cabin down by the fjord in the southern part of Norway. This particular area was known for its folklore. Our parents and grandparents would tell us stories of trolls that lurk in the deep forests, and if you went to uh, t went to uh, deem into their and if you went to deem into their domain, I don't know what deem in. Y your language is a little bit different from America. Anyway, okay. Anyway, and if you went to deem into their domain, they could eat you. So I'm just going to say, if you wander into their domain, I assume that's maybe what that what that means. Anyway, we were warned never to go near the lake, especially at night, or the neck who dwells underneath the water would lure you in with his enchanting song, drag you under and devour you. Our cabin lay not far from where Theodore Kittleson claimed to have seen the creature he later painted. A copy of that painting hung in the hallway of my aunt's house just next to our cabin. I'd always hurry past it whenever I visited her. A, a painting of a monstrous creature that seemed as if it was made by rotting twigs and flesh, lurking ever watchful at the water's edge. The thing haunted my childhood with its piercing gaze and numerous foreboding tales which crept 
which crept into my angst-ridden dreams. One night, when staying over with my sister, mother, and grandmother, I awoke late at night. I had to go relieve myself. Finally deciding I could not hold it in, I slid off my bed into my pants and crept ever so quietly out of the bedroom. Grabbing the old rusty flashlight off the hook on the wall, I proceeded outside towards the lavatory. I didn't go in, for I knew spiders and creepy crawlies might lurk in the dark. Instead, I chose a bush and conducted my business there. While standing there, I happened to gaze up at the night sky. Stars twinkled behind a misty red veil that shimmered in crimson. I gasped when I beheld the moon, larger than I'd ever seen it, red as though bleeding. This must be that blood moon I read about in the paper the other day, but no amount of reading could have prepared me for the thing itself. Walking down the hill, hardly needing my flashlight in the crimson moonlight, it all felt unreal, like I was wandering through some strange dreamscape. My family disapproved of me smoking, so I decided to go down to the dock and light one up there. When I was sure I was far enough away not to be seen, I lit one up and continued down the old dock. Looked over at the other side of the lake, where there was a camping area with an old farm. Supposedly, it dated back to the 12th century. I remembered an old tale I'd heard about the ghost horse. Long ago, there'd been a fire where the farm now stood rebuilt. The barn had caught fire, leaving the horse trapped inside. It had neighed, kicked, and screamed at the door until it finally broke free, emerging from the barn set ablaze. The horse had run across the island, screaming. It ran, leaving behind it a trail of fire as it ran panicked across the fields. According to what people said, half the island had caught fire by the time the horse finally keeled over dead. They say to this day, sometimes you can see the ghost horse run across the island with a trail of fire behind it to this very day. Shaking the memory of the tale from my mind, I continued down towards the dock. There at the edge of the pier sat a little girl with her feet dangling in over the water, perhaps around eight or nine years of age. She had long dark hair and wore a white dress with a blue flower pattern. As I stepped closer, I could see that she was sobbing. Hello, I said, stepping nervously towards her. Do you need help? She turned and looked at me with a sad expression on her face, which soon turned to one of surprise as our eyes met. She then faded and blew across the lake as a puff of smoke, rolling out into the darkness and disappearing. Dumbfounded, I stood there, taking a long drag from my cigarette until it burned down to my fingers. A sudden pain knocked me out of my stupor and I ran back up the hill. What the hell? I muttered to myself as I peeled off my wet pants and replaced them with fresh ones. I lay awake a while, pondering what I'd seen. Later, through some searching in the local newspaper archive, I discovered an old news article from the 1950s where a young girl had fallen into the water and drowned. Could it be her earthbound spirit I saw that night? Beautiful story. Thank you very much for sending that in, Anonymous. Um, I don't know if you wanted to stay anonymous or not, but if you don't sign these, I'm going to assume anonymous because some people just do not want to be known because these these stories are true and, and they're personal, and I understand that. So not everybody's okay with people knowing that it's their story. So, uh, But that's the last story for this evening, which means I am completely out of stories for Fireside Frights, so I need more. If you have a true paranormal story that's happened to you or somebody you know, just go to WeirdDarkness.com and click on Tell Your Story. Uh, thank you for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments, too. My email address is Darren at WeirdDarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. However, if you are sending in a true story for Fireside Frights, please go to the website and send it from there. That comes to a slot to a different e email address and helps me organize things. Uh, WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on any of the sponsors that you hear in the show, find all of my social media, listen to audiobooks that I've narrated, sign up for the email newsletter. You can find other podcasts that I host, including Church of the Undead. You can visit the store for Weird Darkness merchandise and more. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or somebody you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 
1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And a final thought, the amount of our endurance is directly proportionate to the clarity of our vision. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey Weirdos, be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.